Ever wonder, how can an all-powerful good God allow evil and suffering to persist in the world? Only allowing someone to do harm to someone, it's, it's God allowing a baby to be born knowing that it's going to, you know, die at five years old in horrible pain. Makes you wonder, if he is all-powerful, is he truly all-good? That is one big, I mean, that's, that's one thing that casts doubt in my mind on this God being the, the God that you should obey or listen to. But how should the misbehavior in Adam and Eve affect an unborn or very recently born human that has not yet had the chance to meaningfully sin? But I mean, I, I don't yes, know. Yes, correct. That, Great point. Join the conversation as Cliff from Give Me Answers tackles this student's dilemma and addresses the objections that have led to doubts about God's existence. Come along as Cliff gives him answers. The sort of doubt that anybody that believes in God has occasionally in events that are uh, either terrible or... Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Something terrible happens and you can't help but wonder why God didn't... Either do something, why did he allow yes. this to happen, or yes. why is the world this way, that, that, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. That is one big, I mean, that, that's one thing that casts doubt in my mind on this God being the, the God that you should obey or listen to. Because yes. there, I mean, there are other plenty competing gods that might not be as popular anymore, but there are other options yes. uh, that, that with, with uh, other characteristics and uh, personalities. Right. And if this god, um, at least occasionally, either uh, doesn't do or does things that are just questionable, um, I mean, the, the, the absolute best example is the encouragement uh, of the Israelites to do violence to uh, groups of people. Uh, and yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, the, the Amalekites uh, right. especially, but others. I mean, um, sorry, I, I am layering on uh, right. potential reasons to doubt this God. Right. Um, and is that enough reason to say, perhaps I ought not? obey him. I, I should not submit to his authority because he has done questionable okay, things. Now, let's take the first issue you raised, which was because God doesn't intervene more often to prevent suffering, and, uh, yeah. we have a problem with God. Your second issue was because God calls the Jews to wipe out certain people groups like the Amalekites, I got a real problem with God. Right? Well, and just the nature of the world. I mean, uh, not any not one single that. event. Okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> let's, let's stick one at a time, okay? All right, so your first one, and then we'll do your second one, all right? Sure. First one is, come on, Cliff, how can you trust in God in light of the fact that last night you had dinner with a couple who were on the phone with their son, he hits black ice, and he's dead? Mm. Okay, good question. I, I mean, I, I would, I, sorry, I would say there are, better examples in which say his son was murdered by a man who got away with it, will get away with it, and he profited greatly off of their son's death. Okay, all right. Something just, ah. Horrendous, are you bet. Okay, now, here's the issue that, here's the way I work it through. The all-powerful God chose to partially limit his power by giving us a free will. Which means, because God gave me free will, I can haul back, slap this pretty woman in the face, and if I turn to you and say, God made me do it, I'm a liar and a con artist. Hmm. God gave me a hand and a will. He gave me this hand to love and respect her, not to smack her. And if I have the audacity to smack her and then turn to you and say, God made me do it. I had to do it. God made me. I'm a con artist. I'm a lying through my teeth. Okay, now why would free will be so important? Because of love. You see, sir, I can't love her as a human being, if I'm not free. Love demands freedom. So, sorry, uh, I mean, did Adam and Eve have that level of freedom? Yes. That's why they chose to sin, because they were free. And they chose to violate God's will. Okay, so that's why Adam and Eve rebel against God, because they're abusing their free will, and that's where life becomes unfair. And you've got to read the book of Job. Because the Book of Job is a penetrating analysis, which it doesn't give all the answers, but it's dealing with this very issue you've raised, which I'm so grateful for. Job, very righteous man, gets the rug pulled out, his children die, he loses all of his wealth, he loses his health, boils break out all over his body, all right? 
And one of the main points of the book of Job is life is unfair. God is fair. Don't get the two mixed up. So when life throws curveballs into your face, don't clench your fist and wave it at God's face because it's not God doing that to you. It wasn't God who caused that guy to slip on black ice and die an early death. When it comes to the existence of evil and suffering in the world, it is a complex and challenging topic. It is important to approach it with humility and understanding that our finite human minds may not fully comprehend the ways of an infinite God. When considering the question of why God allows terrible events to happen, it is important to understand that God has granted humanity free will. Free will is the ability to make choices, including the choice to do good or to do evil. God created Adam and Eve with free will, allowing them to make choices and decisions. In the story of Adam and Eve, they were given the freedom to eat from any tree in the Garden of Eden, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2, 16, 17. They had the freedom to choose whether or not to obey this commandment. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve chose to disobey God's command and ate from the forbidden tree, introducing sin and its consequences into the world. God's intention was for Adam and Eve to live in harmony with him, and enjoy the blessings of the Garden of Eden. However, their misuse of free will resulted in the entrance of sin, suffering, and the brokenness of the world we experience today. It is important to note that God did not command people to inflict pain on others in general. While the Bible does contain accounts of God commanding specific actions in certain historical contexts, these instances need to be understood within the broader narrative and theological framework of the Bible. In addition, Adam and Eve were indeed given the freedom to make choices, which is known as free will. They had the ability to choose obedience or disobedience. Unfortunately, their choice to disobey God's command led to the introduction of sin into the world. It is crucial to recognize that God's intention was not for pain and suffering to be inflicted upon others, but rather for humanity to live in communion with Him and experience His blessings. No, but God created the world in which that was going to happen in new full will. Uh, I mean, sorry, I, I should uh, get, I mean, choose a more specific example in which it's not God uh, simply allowing someone to do harm to someone. It's, it's God allowing a baby to be born knowing that it's going to, you know, die at five years old in horrible pain. Uh, yeah, I did a funeral four weeks ago for a 14-week-old child that hadn't even been born, right? Died in the mother's womb. Something along those lines, right. yes. Horrible. Yeah, I right? mean, but, but no, exactly. How is, I mean, it, it, it sort of makes sense, though. Okay, um, to, well, to some extent, that perhaps the world should change and result to human misbehavior, but how should the misbehavior in Adam and Eve affect, I mean, well, uh, an unborn or very recently born human that has not yet had the chance to meaningfully sin? But I mean, I, I don't yes, know. Yes, correct. Yeah. Great point. That little 14-week-old child in that mother's womb did nothing wrong. Mm. The child dies, which tips us off to the fact that the unfairness of this life is not a direct result of that person's sin. And that's another reason you got to read the book of Job. Because when Job starts to suffer, a bunch of his friends come to him and they say, Ah, obviously, Job, yeah. you've sinned, and if you would just repent, no more suffering. And at the end of the book of Job, God says to Job, you better pray for your buddies because I'm going to judge them for their self-righteous, wrong counsel. Job was not suffering because of his sin. Job was suffering because he, along with all of us, are born into an unfair, unjust world. Well, and God wanted to prove uh, Job's... I mean, maybe that motivation is overblown, but he wanted to demonstrate to Satan that Job would continue to worship him despite this unfair Good point. Good point. Job, the book of Job points out that real faith in God is not based on the circumstances of life. Mm. It's based on the character of God being good. That's, yeah, no, that, that's the crux of it, really. Like, exactly. If he is the kind of guy that would allow or, or, or I mean, his direct, his ability degree of involvement in Job's suffering is, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, I guess, kind of hard to pin down. Good. But You're right. He was, at the very least, complicit in it. 
Okay, you're right. He and allowed Satan to buffet Job. Yeah. And yes. Why? I do not know. Okay. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Not why did you do that, but I mean, why would you... Or, I mean, doesn't that cast doubt on this being a god that you would want to obey? Uh... Okay, good. Great question. I mean, for the... Yeah, sorry, sorry. Good. You're right. All of a sudden, I'm getting, whoa, you know? God allows that to happen? What's going on here? What's his character really like? That's why the cross of Christ is so crucial. Because what the cross of Christ shows us is God is a suffering God. And that is why suffering people who are poor often instinctually are able to trust in Christ because they can connect with a suffering God and they don't have all these barriers of pride, be it material pride, intellectual pride, physical pride, to hop over. Instinctually, they know they're suffering. They know they're poor. And when they see the cross of Christ, when they begin to understand God is a suffering God who humbles himself, bleeds and dies on a cross, whoa, I can connect with that God. Does that make sense? It, it does, it does. I, I, I'm not entirely certain how well it addresses uh, <laughs> Whether, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, whether there is more reason to doubt your, or this God than there is to doubt some other God that, I mean, you know, you can make him very, very similar and just subtract some of the more worrisome uh, qualities out. I mean, th there are definitely versions of, uh, I mean, yeah, Baha'i probably does that. I'm sure the Unitarians do. They just remove those chunks, and describe God as that, and then. Yeah, it isn't... Is there not enough reason to either do that or say this isn't a god I should uh, submit to? It, it, I mean, I, I, I think this is very... I mean, this is really the very, very important part of religion is the submission to this. Yes, yeah, well, god. Put, and, well put. And it's extremely risky because there are other, well, all sorts of things demanding your submission and obedience. Yes. And reason to submit to the... I mean, you need to have a very, very good reason to submit to this one versus that one. Good. Okay. So now let, I think you're making great points, and it's a real privilege talking with you. Now, please give me the best option to Christ. So let's not, let's, not, let's not talk in the theoretical area. Let's get real practical. What is the best option other than Christ that you think deserves your serious consideration? I don't see the need for an option or, uh, or an alternative. I, I, I... Well, then we're talking theory, then. Well, I, I mean, hang on. Y you mean just something that you believe is worth pursuing, that you believe is good? Yeah. I mean, you've, you've made a very good or do point. You, you mean an authority su to submit to? Yeah, and everybody submits to some authority, be it their own authority, or the authority of materialism, or hedonism, or narcissism, or Islam, or Buddhism, or Jainism. So all of us, you know, follow some path. I, I mean, I, I would probably make the claim that even the greatest saint uh, implicitly submits to his own authority most of the time. Like, that's, that, I mean, uh, he's good. not actively controlled by God. He, he, he's, he's doing stuff on his own. That, like, that, that would be the authority that you need to submit to. And barring, uh, you know, some sort of... Uh, Okay, that's where we Physical disagree. compulsion, yep. like, yeah, what, what other sort of authorities ought you to submit to? Or you bet. Need you to? Right. I have friends who submit to the best way to make money. Mm. They get up so stinking early in the morning, they get back so stinking late at night from Wall Street, it's amazing. Uh -uh. They are deeply, deeply committed to making a boatload of money. And it shows in their lifestyle, it shows in their priorities. I have other friends who are deeply committed to physical pleasure. Whatever stimulates my nerve endings, mm. that's what I'm going to go for. I have other friends who are deeply committed to themselves. They're narcissists, totally preoccupied with themselves. They have no problem stepping on you or on me as long as it gets them ahead. I the brownie knows the boss, they'll do whatever it takes as long as they get ahead. All right, so we all follow some path. 
We all submit to the authority of some idol that we're living for. I'm saying that submitting to Jesus Christ is by far the wisest decision because he loves you more than anybody. He's wiser than anybody. Why? Because he's the God who made you. That is why I pray that you will put your faith in him and submit to his authority. As a Christian, I understand that the sin of Adam and Eve has had far-reaching consequences that affect all of humanity, including unborn children. The Bible teaches that all people are born with a sinful nature inherited from Adam and Eve, Romans 5.12. This means that even before we have the chance to commit meaningful sins, we are already separated from God and in need of His salvation. However, it is important to note that God is just and fair. He does not hold unborn children accountable for the sins of their ancestors. Each person is responsible for their own choices and actions. Ezekiel 18.20 God's love and mercy extend to all, including those who have not yet had the opportunity to make personal choices. As humans on earth, it can be difficult to understand and reconcile the unfairness and suffering we experience. We may question why innocent children are affected by the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin. In these moments, it is essential to remember that God has not abandoned us in our suffering. The cross of Christ is a powerful demonstration of God's love and His willingness to partake in our suffering. Jesus, who is fully God and fully human, willingly took on our sins and suffered on our behalf. Through His sacrifice, He offers us salvation, forgiveness, and the hope of eternal life. In times of confusion and pain, we can find comfort in knowing that God understands our suffering. He is not distant or indifferent to our struggles, but is intimately acquainted with our grief and pain. Isaiah 53, 3. We can bring our burdens to Him and find solace in His presence. Additionally, as Christians, we have the assurance that our present sufferings are not in vain. The Bible teaches that God will one day make all things new and there will be no more pain or suffering. Revelation 21.4 our hope lies in the promise of a future where God will wipe away every tear and restore all that has been broken. While we may not fully comprehend the complexities of sin, suffering, and fairness, we can trust in God's character and His ultimate plan for redemption. He is a loving and just God who offers comfort, hope, and the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ.